Okay, so um, away from the technical issues to today's lecture, we're going to be talking about muscle. And uh, I guess before I get started, uh, somebody, somebody in Vancouver or NHL hates me because they did half the Stanley Cup playoffs on the nights when I'm lecturing, uh, which means I missed two games already, I'm missing the third one, or will be in about an hour. I'm not happy about it. So I'm going to try to get through my material very quickly today. Hopefully, <laughs> get to catch the last bit of the game. Hopefully. Yeah. I'm sure it'll come up today. Anyway, so before we jump right into the histology, there is a little bit of terminology that we probably should cover. So, first of all, there's a little bit of hierarchy. Uh, and so, when I say certain terms, I want to make sure that you understand which ones I'm referring to, what it is that I'm referring to. So, uh, let's go from smallest to biggest. Uh, when I'm talking about a myofilament, I'm talking about an actual protein. Okay, anything that starts with myo has to do with muscle in some way. Okay, so, if you come up with any term, you come across any term that starts with myo or has a myo somewhere in it, it has to do with muscle. Myofilament is some sort of muscle filament. Filament kind of implies that it's something relatively small. And so myofilaments are the actual protein components responsible for contraction, things like myosin and actin. How many of you have taken a physiology course? Enjoy it. Very good. So, well, technically, I think it's one of the prerequisites for this course, so you should have it. So, you're probably familiar with the contraction itself and the contraction cycle. I won't go into a lot of details here. We'll also that will be how you know what actin and myosin are. Now, these actin and myosin uh, filaments are organized in a particular way where it actually ends up being organized into fairly relatively thick bundles. Now, these bundles are referred to as myofibrils. And so these myofibrils, there's going to be many of those within a muscle cell. And for reasons that you will find out very shortly, muscle cells are often referred to as muscle fibers. Okay. So we're going to move from myofilament to myofibril to muscle fiber or a myocyte. And we will very shortly go into higher levels of this hierarchy as well, where you can actually take this a little bit further and talk about bundles of muscle fibers and then bundles of those bundles. And so it gets more complicated. Well, not really more complicated, but just more terminology for you to memorize. Yay. Okay, terminology. This is stuff that you might come across. Uh, I'm not going to be using a lot of it myself, but if you're doing your own research, if you're going online and Googling things, you might come across some of these things as well. Okay, so uh, these are a little bit older. Um, sarcosome, anything that says the sarco basically refers to muscle fibers or muscle cells. Okay. And so the sarcosome is often described as being a muscle cell, although I have also seen it used to describe a mitochondria within a muscle fiber. Okay. So that one seems to be kind of a confused term. The less confused terms, sarcoplasm, referring to the cytoplasm of a muscle fiber. Sarcolema as the plasma membrane, and sarcoplasmic reticulum for the endoplasmic reticulum. The only one of these terms that I will be using is this last one, sarcoplasmic reticulum. Uh, that's because it's a very specialized type of endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, it is actually used to store calcium ions and releases them when stimulated to start the contraction cycle. So again, I'm going to be using this last one, so I want you to be aware of that one. The other three you might come across if you're doing your own reading on your own time. Is this microphone too loud, by the way? I feel like, okay. I feel like I'm shouting at you guys. Okay. So this is just there to kind of yeah, remind you of that hierarchy. And so what we have in this lower right-left-hand corner of this image is the actual myofilaments. 
So what you see here is the actin pigment, and as you can see, it's a bit more complicated than just actin. There's a little bit more. It's not just a simple straight protein. There's a little bit more there than that. Um, and here is a part of the myosin filament. Uh, the myosin fil filament is often referred to as the heavy chain, uh, and the actin filament is referred to as the light chain or the light filament. Okay, so thick and thin filaments. Um, so myosin is a thick filament. It is bigger and thicker um, than the actin filaments, which is what you can see here. Uh, what we're seeing here is basically just kind of zoom out from this to this. And so what you're seeing here is this arrangement that you might be familiar with as the sarcomere. And what we have here is a Z line from here to here. We have actin filaments coming up here on the sides of this sarcomere, you can see it's much thinner than this myosin filament in the middle. Um, besides actin and myosin, there's a variety of other proteins involved in this too. I'm not going to get into the details of it. Um, it's not really that important for the purposes of this course, but for the courses you might have to know that. We're just going to really focus on the two main ones. Now, if we were to zoom out a little bit more, what we're seeing up here is one of those bundles of those filaments. That would be a mitofibril. Okay, so here's longitudinal and cross-section. And you can see that if you have a whole bunch of these mitofibrils, you might start to see a pattern, a repeating pattern of these proteins showing up as showing up as the banding pattern that we will be looking at later on. And again, a single mitofibril will be found within a muscle fiber. And you can see a whole bunch of these muscle mitofibrils fibrils uh, within the muscle fiber. So this will be a single cell. That single cell will be found within this larger structure called a fascicle. And then you might have multiple fascicles together in a larger structure called a muscle. So that's what you're seeing here. So that's the hierarchy. So today's lecture, I want to talk a little bit about the cells initially. And notice again, the list of cells look a little familiar. Uh, well, fibroblasts are showing up again, but it doesn't have fibroblasts. They're showing up a lot. Probably one of the more common cells in your body. Uh, they're found very frequently in a variety of different tissues or associated with a variety of different tissues. Um, we have myoblasts, myocytes. So again, notice the suffixes blast and site is showing up again. So again, as soon as you know that, you see that, you should be able to figure out roughly what it is you're looking at. And something called a Purkinje fiber. Um, please do not confuse these with Purkinje cells. There is a cell called Purkinje cell, which is very, very different from a Purkinje fiber. Okay. And I tell you this right now, and I can bet you right now that about a third of you will still get that question wrong on the exam. Okay. So I'm telling you right now, going to show up. So know the difference. Don't confuse the two. So we'll also talk about the ECM. We'll talk about the cells in ECM first, and then we'll talk about the actual tissues and how these cells are organized into tissues. So, actually, In terms of properties, obviously this is going to be one of the main ones, contractility, muscle contracts. It's also elastic, so it's able to recoil back, um, so it has elasticity. Um, extensibility, so it can be stretched, it can do this without hurting your muscles. Okay? So it is extensible, it is elastic. So after I do this, my muscles don't stay stretched like this. They recoil back. Okay. And they are excitable or irritable. Okay. Which means they can take an impulse. Some sort of an act, well not an actual potential necessarily, but some sort of a depolarization of the membrane can occur and that can be transmitted along the surface of the cell or from cell to cell as well. It's become very, very important. 
Now, in general, the next few slides are going to be mostly describing one type of cell, mus one type of muscle cell, and that would be a skeletal muscle cell. Uh, we will see something similar showing up in the other types of muscle. And I will point out where it is different. But for the most part, when we think of muscle, we think of the sort of this basic unit uh, that is found in muscle cells that is responsible for contraction. And so with this slide, I'd like to convince you that these are in fact visible things, that you actually can see them. Unfortunately, with the lighting in this room and the projection screen as it is, uh, I'm going to have a hard time actually showing them to you on some of the slides that are coming up. So you're going to have to use your imagination or very look very, very closely into your own computer screens and try to see the striation pattern that I will be describing for you. So the sarcomere, I think what I'll do is I will switch over to a drawing, it is described as having a Z line on one side a Z line on the other. We're not going to worry too much about the types of proteins involved with this. Now, emanating from this Z line is going to be a set of actin fibers or actin filaments. Obviously, we have actin. Now, it's not only really shown like this in two dimensions. If we were to try to actually look at this in three dimensions, and see if I can try to draw this in three dimensions. Well, maybe I should. It might be more confusing than it's really worth. Um, but basically, Basically, each myosin subunit kind of has a long chain and then a head group. Really, it's two head groups. And that's a myosin chain. So, what we have is a bunch of these kind of just stuck together. And they're going in both directions. Just think of these long fibers with these head groups attached, linked to one another down the middle. Okay. 
Can anybody here describe to me how this stuff actually works? Anybody closer to the actual rest of the class? Oh, come on. Really, you all took physiology. You all know this. Come on, describe this. To what level? To what level? <laughs> Let's start with these. What happens? They step and step and step. They step and step and step. Okay? Let's take it a little deeper. Yeah. Um, I mean, the head's attached to the fibers and they push the fiber. Okay, well, the pull probably would be a more appropriate term. Yes, okay, so the myosin head groups will bind to the actin and they will ratchet to pull. Okay. One way you can actually demonstrate this for yourselves is find yourself a partner who you're sitting next to. Extend your arms towards each other. Not too far, you don't want to punch them this time. Okay, so go ahead, extend your arm. Uh, hopefully the one that's closer to that person, not, you're not kind of bumping each other, you're extending out your arm. Okay. One of you is going to be the act and one of these is going to be the myosin. Okay? So the myosin, person with a skinnier arm, the myosin will be the person with the um, also skinny arm because you're going to be one of the subunits of the myosin heavy chain or the chain. Okay? So decide who the myosin is, who the actin is. If you're the actin, you just keep your arm up. You've got the easy job. If you're the myosin, you're going to have your arm underneath, and then you're going to grab the actin, and then pull just with your wrist. Okay? Just flex your wrist. That's all the myosin head group is doing. Okay? That's what it's doing. Now, extend your other arm, that's another one of the myosin subunits, and grab on and pull again. And pull again, pull again, pull again, pull again. Watch that person come closer and closer and closer to you. Okay? That's what's going on on both sides. Okay? So that's how it works. That's how you can try to visualize it for yourself. Okay? So um, the actin in your pair, their body will be the Z line. And so you'll see that Z line getting closer to you without the actin doing anything. And without you having to really pull on the elbow or anything. All you're doing is just flexing your wrist and just flexing, pulling, grabbing the other arm, flex, pull, flex, 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 flex. So just keep on pulling incrementally on that act until that side line gets closer. Okay, so what else do we need to worry about on that slide that we just had on the screen? Well, what we have is Initially, when scientists, when microscopists were looking at these sections of muscle, they didn't see all of this complexity. They didn't see all of this. They had no idea what this was. Right? All they saw was that there, were, there was a banding pattern. There was a line, a line, a line, a line. And then there was a light region. And I'm just going to draw this. Color. Light region, a darker region, kind of filled in region. Filled in region like this. And they just saw this alternating pattern of this dark band and the light band and the dark band and the light band. And the light band always seemed to have a little thinner line in the middle. Okay. So, this they refer to as the isotropic band. And this is the anisotropic band. Am I going to spell those for you? No. They need to know. We just refer to them as the I band and the A band. Okay, so I band and the A band. Okay. How do you remember these so that you don't forget? 
which one's the I band and which one's the A band? Well, actually, it's quite easy. And chances are you've tried to memorize it for physiology. I don't know if you succeeded or not, but after this, you won't have any problems. Because the white band is the I band, and the visible, no, not really. Let me put a different mark here. Okay, so the light band is the I band, and the dark band is the A band. Pretty simple. Okay. Let's make it more complicated. I, I need simple. Let's make it more complicated. We, of course, know this is the Z line. Okay. Now, when micro microscopist's tools got better, it's basically all want more power, more resolution, uh, they noticed that the A band actually was subdivided into slightly darker and slightly lighter regions. And so what they noticed was in fact kind of a little bit more like this, where the dark band is subdivided into two darker regions by a middle line Again, we had an extra band showing up in there.
Come on, guys. It's not a trick question. Yes? Because we've got a lot of filaments in place. We've got overlapping, actin, minusin, all together, all this stuff in the way. So, yeah, we have a lot of material in the way, so a lot of light will be blocked. It's going to look darker. Why is this region, this is the H band, going to be lighter staining than the rest of the A band? Okay, all the heads are off to the sides. All we're seeing is myosin. There's no actin in this region. So all we're seeing is only myosin and no head groups. So then again, there's less stuff in the way. That's why it looks a little bit lighter. Okay, trick question now. Why is this little line down the middle going to be darker? Because it's more protein in this region as well. Okay, so there is more stuff there that will block some light from passing. Okay. So I think we've covered everything that's on this slide here. Okay. So again, here you can actually see a whole bunch of sarcomeres. So this is not just one sarcomere that we're looking at here. This is one on top of another on top of another. That's why you're seeing this banding pattern. If all you saw was one sarcomere, you'd be looking at a much higher resolution image, a much higher magnification than this. Okay? But what you're seeing here is numerous sarcomeres. And their Z bands are all aligned with one another. And again, we're seeing here a light band. This is the I band with a Z line down the middle. This is a dark band. This dark line in the middle of this lighter region on either side. The lighter region is the H band. And the dark line on the middle is the N line. Okay. This is exactly what we just did. By the way, for this chapter, all the figures between 5 and 6 are the same. So, again, they changed the addition on you. They didn't really change the figures that much. Some of them are a little nicer, I guess. Some of the drawings are a little fancier, fancier looking, but that's about it. Okay, so, contraction. Again, you guys, all to physiology, and apparently you all know this. Let's really quickly go over it. Well, I'm going to go over the part that's really most important to us. Uh, so, first of all, there are structures called triads or dyads in the muscles. Now, depending on what type of muscle you're looking at, you're looking at slightly different things. But in general, what we're looking at is basically this is the cell membrane of the muscle fiber. There's going to be a structure called a transverse tubule invaginating into the interior. So it's a cell membrane. This is a transverse or T tubule. These are going to be filled with something a little darker. Calcium ions. Turns out that calcium ions are very tightly controlled within the cells. 
Uncontrolled release of calcium is usually a sign of a cell in trouble. So cells very strongly regulate the presence and concentrations of calcium ions within their cytoplasm. So what we just draw can be referred to as a triad. If you want to know what a dyad looks like, same thing except we only have one cisterna. We don't have two cisterna on both sides, we just have one cisterna on one side of the T2U. Okay? Both perform the same functions, but they just found different cell groups. So the T2 pills are probably the more common ones, and those will be, yes? Can you just cover the triad? So this whole structure here, the T2 pill plus the terminal cisternae on either side, so these three structures together are referred to as a triad. And how does sarcoplasmic Well, this structure here is sarcoplasmic reticulum, and basically this region right here of the sarcoplasmic reticulum is referred to as a terminal cisterna, it's just kind of a dilated region of it. Okay? So again, the three of them together are referred to as a triad. Those are mostly found in the skeletal muscle. If all you had was just a T-tubule plus one of these terminal cisternae, that would be referred to as a dyad, and that would be mostly found in the cardiac muscle. Again, that's not a hard and fast rule. It doesn't mean that you're not going to find any cardiac muscle fibers that have triads. But in general, they're more likely to have dyads as opposed to triads. Why is that important? not really that important. It's just the way it seems to be. Yes? Um, from your diet, it's still having T2 zone. That's still described by um, T2 zone. So, so it's referred to as a diet because there's two structures. Right? So you have T2 mule, but you only have one of these. You don't have a terminal cistern on either side. You just have one terminal cistern near the T2 mule. So if you don't have a terminal cistern, then you don't you just don't have this dilation. Here. You might have a sort of plasma particular in your body here, but it doesn't make close contact with the T2 mule. And that close contact is really the important thing. Because when this muscle is depolarized, when this muscle fiber is depolarized, that depolarization will travel down the length of the membrane, travel into the interior of this T2 mule, and then cause a change in this membrane here and cause a release through these channels of calcium into the cytoplasm. So this terminal cisterna and the T2 mule are in very close association with one another. So it's actually a very, very important structure for the function of the muscle itself. Now, when the calcium is released, what happens? Those are the other physiology terms, most of you. What happens when calcium is released? Yes? So basically what you have is, let's go back a couple of slides, just so we have a visual. Okay. Notice this image at the very high magnification at the very bottom corner here. Okay. So what we have here, we have the actin filaments. Those actin filaments are wrapped by troponin tropomyosin complex. When the calcium is released, the calcium interacts with troponin and tropomyosin causes a conformational change. It tends to remove it from the binding sites for these head groups here. So what you have is now these head groups can bind to the actin. Once they bind, they ratchet and pull on the actin. Okay? So again, remember, you have a whole bunch of these here. So one of them ratchets, another one ratchets, another one, another one, another one. Another one. OK, here's a common misconception. Or I guess the question on this conception, yeah. Um, too late, cast out the diet um, When is ATP used in all of this? Obviously, the energy has to be used. So, when is energy actually used during this whole process? Yeah? Is it used when uh, thing flashes into it and the, the vehicle uh, has no food? Okay, there's the misconception. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> when it binds to it? When it releases it. 
you have to hydrolyze ATP to release. That's what I meant to call. Sorry, I misunderstood. I misunderstood. I'm sorry. Okay, so you need ATP to release. Any one of you know what rigor mortis is? Yeah. Rigor mortis. What is rigor mortis? When what gets stuck? The elements. Okay. Um, on a grander scale, let's say grander scale. When you die, somebody says something about when you die. What about when you die? Yes. Okay, you're getting too technical for me. So, yes. Your legs are stiff when you're dead. Okay, so when you die, all your muscles contract and they stay contracted. Why? You have no more ATP to release. Okay. So remember that, and you'll know when ATP is loose. So again, ATP is required to release that head. So that head group will automatically just ratchet. It doesn't require energy for that. It uses energy to be able to unbind from the actin, go back to its normal position, its unbound position, grab on someplace else later on, and ratchet again. Okay? So the ATP is used to unbind, not to bind. But again, that's a very common misconception. You think, it's the power stroke. It needs power, so you need energy. No, you don't. You need energy to remove that break that bond between the two proteins. Okay, so, so again, action is released, and so again, binding, the mice can bind to it. The traction occurs, and then, again, calcium is going to be taken up as soon as it's no longer required. So, calcium is released from the cercoplasmic reticulum from that terminal cisterna, and then it's quickly going to be actively taken back up. So that again, that external cisterna is ready to release calcium again when the next impulse comes in. So we can again start the whole cycle all over again. Unless the person is dead, in which case they run under ATP and the muscle remain in the state in which they were found. By the way, rigor mortis does go away after one. Yes? Is it TT loose or is it depolarized? And which arms drive? So what happens before? Okay, so the T tubule is depolarized. So it doesn't mean that it's Forms are tried, what is depolarized? That's not really what the intention was. I didn't show you all these slides. So the T2 bill is depolarized, the depolarization travels into the interior of the cell, basically brings that depolarization deep into the within the cell, and this way cerebroplasmic can reticulum can release the calcium close to where the myofilaments are. So here's a, an example, a diagram. We'll talk more about this diagram at the end of the course when we talk about the peripheral nervous system. We'll talk about how the actual neuron that we're seeing here, this terminal bouton that we're seeing here, is going to participate in all of this. Okay? But what you can see in this diagram is, again, this is the membrane. You've got little perforations along the way, and these are the T tubules, and they go deep into the interior of the cell. They kind of travel along the surface of these mild fibrils. And again, you have this extensive tubular network, but you can see this is the sarcoplasmic reticulum here, relatively thin little saccules. And then around the T tubules, you have these very large dilated bags. Okay? Those are the terminal cisterna. Okay? So in this case here, what you have is a triad, because you can see terminal cisterna on the other side of the T tubule here. Again, if this was a dyad, you would only see these cisterna on one side of the tubule, not necessarily on another. Okay. Okay, um, based on what I learned in histology, that we, we win, um, this diagram is actually inaccurate. Because according to this diagram, we have the triad located at the Z line. But if this is a triad, it's a skeletal muscle, and the triads actually occur at the AI junction. What's the AI junction, you might ask? Well, I'm glad you did. <laughs> the AI junction. It is the point at which the A band meets the I band. So we'll be right around here. Right, so that's the AI junction. Again, you might come across that to show up in some of your searches and you'll be wondering what type are they talking about. So the AI junction is the point at which the A band have, we don't have a this. So the point at which the A band, like for example here, meets the I band. Now, well actually while we're on this diagram. What's going to happen if this muscle contracts? So, 
If that sarcomere contracts, what's going to happen? How will it look at the end of that contraction? Yeah. The H band disappears. Sorry? The H band disappears. The H band is what? Disappears. Disappears. The H band becomes smaller. Yeah. Okay. What else? Does the headbands get closer? Um, does the myosin or the actin get any shorter? Okay. None of the proteins contract in any way. Okay. It's just all about them traveling and sliding past one another. That's why it's called the sliding filament model. Okay. okay. Back to the histology. So there's a diagram of what we just mentioned. So again, nothing that's shorter, nothing that longer. We we'll just move the two Z lines closer together. And that means that the H band that was from here to here suddenly got much smaller. And also the I band, which was from here to, well, wherever the other one, one of these was, one of these eight I junction ones, got a lot shorter. Okay? But nothing really, none of the proteins really shrank. actual types of muscle, and we'll talk about the cell types as we're going through them, because it's actually a little easier to describe them this way. Because depending on the type of muscle you're looking at, the cell will look a little different. So, you can divide muscle into two general categories. I know it says three. Two general categories. One is smooth muscle, the other is strided muscle. Okay. Um, but strident is subdivided into skeletal and cardiac. Technically, it's subdivided into visceral striated, skeletal, and cardiac, so three types. But because visceral striated muscle looks just like skeletal muscle under the microscope, we're just going to try to lump them together into one category. And so histologically, we're going to describe two types of muscle, two types of striated muscle. So skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle. Uh, now, why is that distinction made between skeletal muscle and visceral striated muscle? Well, skeletal muscle is the muscle that is associated with the skeleton, pulls on the skeleton somewhere. Visceral striated muscle is made up of very similar looking fibers, but they're not really attached to the skeleton. Like what? Like your tongue, for example. The muscle in your tongue looks, ju looks just like skeletal muscle. But it's not really attached to the skeleton, is it? It's like whole yours isn't. Uh, there's a portion initially of your esophagus, okay, in the initial portion, right near your oral cavity, right near your pharynx, that also is going to be lined by striated muscle. It's going to look skeletal, but again, your esophagus is not attached to the skeleton. It's not pulling against the skeleton. Okay? So again, it's just a visceral striated muscle. But again, it looks the same as skeletal, so we're going to lump them together and treat them as such. Okay? So I'm not really going to be making that distinction when I'm talking about these things in my slides. Okay, so let's talk about the striated or maybe skeletal muscle in this case. So, as I mentioned earlier, most of it is attached to the skeletal system, so skeletal muscle. Um, some of it is not. So things like the tongue or the inner, initial portions of your esophagus, that's going to have that visceral striated muscle. And again, we're just going to just lump it together as a skeletal muscle. Now, it is controlled by the somatic motor nervous system or somatic motor nerves, which basically means that you have to have innervation. You have direct control over it. So if you're ever wondering what kind of muscle is working right now, Ask yourself, do I have direct control over it? So for example, your tongue, do you have direct control over it? It's really almost. Okay. Initial portions of your esophagus and pharynx up here, esophagus. You can control your swallowing, so you have control over that. Okay. Um, what kind of muscle do you have here about around your anal opening? It's really muscle. 
again, it's not attached to the skeleton necessarily. It's got a visceral striated muscle, but again, it's striated muscle. You have control over it, hope for it. Okay? <laughs> so, if you can control it, it's skeletal. Okay? Counter example, can you control your heart by thinking about it? Well, depending on how scared you make yourself, I suppose. <laughs> uh, but you can't really directly control your heart rate. So, no, you can't really control that muscle with your motor nerves. Okay? Can you contract your muscles of your stomach by thinking about it? No, that's smooth muscle. Okay? So this is the one muscle type that you do have direct control over. Okay? So, motor nerves. So, this type of muscle is responsible for relatively short controlled contractions. Now, you might say, what do you mean short? I can exercise for an hour, and my muscles don't really get that tired. I'm talking about short relative to your cardiac muscle, which works for your lifetime. When it stops working, you stop working. Okay? That's what we talk about when we talk about long function. Okay? It's working for a long time. It's working literally for a very long time. Okay? Your stomach probably doesn't really take that much of a rest, your stomach. Not like about your six pack, or in my case, one pack. You're talking about the ones around the actual stomach. Okay? So, again, your skeletal muscle, relatively short contractions. Okay? It does become tired, depending on how much exercise you do. You know, it's it tired faster, sometimes slower. Now, it also depends on what type of skeletal muscle you have. Skeletal muscle can be subdivided into, let's go with two main types. It's a bit more complicated than that, but let's just keep it relatively simple. There's type 1 fibers and type 2 fibers. And this is specifically referring to the muscle fibers, so muscle cells. Okay. So we're not saying a whole muscle itself is type 1 or type 2. A whole muscle would actually be a mixture of the two. Now what proportions you have in each muscle will vary depending on what type of you know, work you have made them do over time. So, what is the difference? That's what hockey is going to come up in a moment. Type 1 fibers are slow twitch fibers. Type 2 are fast twitch fibers. Okay. What does that mean? Well, slow twitch fibers are responsible for relatively long, slow contractions. Okay. These do not get tired very easily. So, resistant to fatigue. These do get tired, so let me leave it to you. These are resistant to fatigue, which means there's something about them that allows them to be able to work for long periods of time without getting tired. Well, why? Well, they have lots of mitochondria. and also high concentration of myoglobin. What's myoglobin? It's a transport for the muscle. It's a what? Oxygen transport for the muscle. Well, it's actually an uh, oxygen storage for the muscle. Right? So myoglobin is kind of like hemoglobin, but actually has a much higher affinity for oxygen. So it will hold on to oxygen uh, very strongly, and so it's a good storage vehicle for oxygen for these muscles. Okay. Type 2 fibers obviously don't really have as many mitochondria, so fewer mitochondria. They actually rely on glycolysis after a while. So once they use up their easily available energy and oxygen stores, 
they will go ahead and use glycolysis and just get the rest of their energy that way. So obviously, these muscles are going to definitely, or muscle fibers are definitely going to get tired more easily. They also have less myoglobin. These muscles do store glycogen. So that means that they have easily available glucose when they need it. But again, the glucose will be broken down by glycolysis after a little while because they run out of oxygen, they don't have as much to work with. So oxidative phosphorylation is less likely to happen. Type 1 muscle fibers are responsible for things like posture. So these are muscles that can work for long periods of time without really fatiguing very easily. Marathon runners will tend to have a lot of these in their legs. Or I guess in general, really. Again, these things don't work very fast, they don't cause very fast contractions, but they will be able to work for long periods of time. Okay. Type 2 fibers tend to be used for rapid movement. place for the maple leaves <laughs> because their defense sucks every <laughs> year. They've at least shown that they can score this past season, but that still sucks. It breaks down so frequently. The leaves need a good goal. Um, and you know, poor guy every single time it falls to him to hold up the leaves. He's gotta really use those fast or sorry, yeah, the fast twitch muscles to you know, because if he doesn't stop that fuck, nobody else will. The defense is not going to help. Anyway, that's a yeah. question about the leaves or about this? <laughs> Which one is generally stronger? Strength has more to do with how many myofibrils do you have in your fibre, in your actual muscle. We'll be getting to that very right shortly, actually. Okay. This just has more to do with how fast they work. Now again, you don't have a whole bicep just made out of type 2 or type 1 muscle. Although again, if you're a goalie, you probably have a lot more type 2 in your biceps than most other goalie, than most other people. Okay? Uh, how do you get one versus the other? When you're training, especially when you're younger. At this point, I need to break it to you, but the muscles you've got are the ones you're stuck with for the rest of your life for the most part. So, you're not going to be able to switch over to a new sport all the time. You might be able to, to some extent. There is some evidence for a transition that they can switch over from one type to the other. They can re-specialize to some extent. Uh, but I wouldn't imagine that process to be very uh, easy to perform. Why would you think that? Why do you think it might be difficult to go switch types? of cells, type of muscle fibers. If the muscles you have right now, the muscle fibers you have right now are the ones you're stuck with for the rest of your life, right? you're not generating new ones. So why do you think it might be difficult to switch? Yeah? Well, depending on what sport you grew up with or in your you like there's a condition that you basically okay. learned to adapt to your physical Right, so I mean, as you were growing up, you know, you were putting a certain amount of stress on them as you were growing up. Hopefully you were very athletic at the time, and so you've got muscles that are pretty specialized for whatever you want. But if you were more of a couch potato or a video game player as opposed to an actual sporty person, um, you may not have developed very specialized muscles or may not have developed you know, fast twitch fibers. Uh, you might have mostly slow twitch fibers. But you know, in terms of just, you know, don't even think about specialization so much. If, so if you think about what's inside of a muscle cell, I'm going to 
just turn this thing off. Look inside the sub. Do you think it would be easy to retool for a new function at this point? Would it be easy to just kind of squeeze in one mitochondria or more a little bit just because you feel like it? Probably not. These cells are very, very full. I want you to remember that these cells are packed with stuff. They are packed with protein. In fact, skeletal muscle fibers are so packed with things that their nuclei are pushed off to the periphery of the cell. The cell itself is just filled with protein. And basically, if you want to have any organelles like nuclei, they're going to be on the outside, or will look like they're on the outside of the cell. They're going to be pushed off to the periphery. Okay. One of the reasons that we call them muscle fibers and not muscle cells, especially with skeletal muscle, is that these cells are actually syncytia. I should probably spell that for you. The term is syncytia. It basically means a bag of cells. Okay. So it's not just one cell. You have multiple cells fusing together to produce this large agglomeration aggregation of these cells, you have one membrane and multiple nuclei within it. So it technically doesn't really fit with the definition of a cell anymore. It's referred to as a syncytium, or in our case here, it's a muscle fiber. Yeah? Just with regards to um, type 1 and type 2, mm -hmm. um, as we age, yep. is there um, basically a better type of cell to have? As of the ages, is it better to have type 1 or type 2? It's a very good question. I guess if you just think about the, uh, the function, it might be better to have type 1 cells. Right, because because they're, they less likely get tired and they're specialized for slower action. But <laughs> it depends on whether you want to be an active brown or a couch potato. So it depends, I think. Uh, I don't think it really, there is an answer to that. Uh, I think it just depends on the type of person you are. Uh, so, um, and I think you should be planning about it in terms of when I'm 80, what's the best cell that you have? I think you should be planning for, for the rest of my life, what am I going to be happier with? And at this point, it's too late. Yeah? So, what do you mean? Very good. Okay, so when you're training, your muscles grow, or so you think. Okay, so the good news and the bad news. The good news is you can train and you can make your muscles grow. The bad news is you're not going to be Arnold Schwarzenegger anytime soon. Okay. Um, and that's because of the terms I introduced you guys last time. I talked about atrophy and hypertrophy. They're going to be very much important for today's lecture. There's a reason why I throw these terms at you sometimes. So, Let's just go through the slide really quickly and then get into the more fun stuff. So, skeletal muscle cells are kind of cigar shaped. They're very elongated, very large cells. I'm talking a really large cell. I'm talking about from here to here is one cell. Okay, so we're looking at a few centimeters in length. Okay, so these are definitely not microscopic anymore. I'm not saying mine aren't microscopic, I'm saying they're not microscopic anymore. Okay. So, um, they are very long, multinucleated. So we have multiple nuclei. But again, they're filled in completely on the inside with protein. Again, those myofibrils are very densely packed, and in between them is a little bit of room, and that's where you have that sarcoplasmic reticulum and those mitochondria. So nuclei are eccentric. Okay. Again, they're off to the side of the boundaries of the cell. My fibers are arranged in bundles. So you have these bundles that are actually, if you cut this muscle fiber cross section, you can see these small little dots within the actual cell cell. And I'll try to show that to you on one of the slides later on. And these are referred to as Conheim fields. And I mentioned earlier, try to locate the AI junctions. Okay, so I threw this picture in here because I was kind of hoping to be able to show you striations. Uh, and unfortunately, obviously, it's not that clearly, but from where I am standing, I can see them. But then again, I know what I'm looking for, so uh, you might have a harder time. So, how about this? 
I'm going to try to one of these. But of course, that slide isn't really that clearly visible, so let's try a different tab. I'm going to try to draw roughly what you're seeing on there. If I remember what there is. I've got a nucleus roughly here, another one here, another one here, another one here. So we've got a cell boundary. There's another boundary here, another boundary here somewhere, maybe a few more nuclei. I don't know how accurate this drawing is being, but hopefully it helps. So basically your muscle fibers are going on this slide up and down. Okay? So cells are arranged like this, going from top to bottom of the slide. Okay, so this is the edge of the cell, this is the other edge of the cell, or the spider. We've got multiple nuclei, they're all at the periphery. Everything on the inside is red, okay? and that is the actual protein. The the, all the myofilaments are just filling the cell completely. Okay, I'm going to do more with this, so I don't have to draw all this yet, because I want to know where I'm going with this. So you got a cell that's completely filled in with protein. Okay. So if you have A and I bands, you might start to I'm just drawing this a lot bigger than it really is. You might start to see something like this. Okay. Where you start to see a striation pattern. And again, when you look at your own slides on your own screens, you might see that illustration having a lot thinner than this. Okay? But I just wanted to show you that if you have, basically you've got a single myofibril going, I don't know if you draw that in a different color. Okay? You have a single myofibril going from one end of the cell to the other. Okay? That would be the length of the myofibril, let's say. Within that myofibril, you've got striations. Those striations are going across that fiber, so they're going across like this. So really, when you look at the slide, if you look at some of these cells, what you're actually going to be seeing is striations going across from edge of the cell to edge of the cell. And so the darker bands are the A bands, and the lighter bands are the I bands. Okay? So let's try this. Let's try turning out the lights and see if we can maybe see this. We look really, really hard. I can't turn out all the lights at all. As far as they go. Well, that's great. And the light switches anywhere else? Okay, well, again, from where I'm standing, I can see the striations going across, back and forth. Um, again, if you can't see them, look on your computer screens, okay? Because that's really the only way that you can see them in this room. Okay? So, uh, again, just, if you can see it, great. If you can't, look at the computer screen when you get home, if you don't have it in front of you. Uh, but I won't worry too much about it. Let's just go on to, okay, what happens when you train? Okay. If you start training, what are you doing to your muscles? Tearing them. Mm -hmm. You hurt them. We hurt the ones we love. Sometimes. Um, so, yeah, you do hurt, your, you damage your muscles to some extent. One of the cell types that is frequently found within skeletal muscle is called a satellite cell. Okay. Satellite, like what orbits the Earth. That kind of satellite. Well, not that kind of satellite, it's spelled the same way. So, satellite. Now, this satellite cell is not specific to muscle. Okay. And you will be seeing that term showing up again later on this semester. So it's not a specific term specific to uh, muscle type of thin muscle or a cell type of thin muscle. It's just a cell that we kind of say, okay, this is a satellite cell. Um, it is one that is close to, or quite often found near, skeletal muscle fibers. Okay? 
Uh, don't ask me to show you one. Basically, it's kind of like a mesenchymal cell. It's a stem cell of muscle. Okay? And so, what's going to happen is when you do some damage to the membrane of your muscle fiber, the satellite cell is going to fuse with the muscle fiber to help regenerate. Okay? Now, let's think about this. We have a muscle fiber that has more nuclei. Therefore, it has more DNA. Therefore, it can make more copies of mRNA of the proteins that the cell might need because obviously it's not keeping up with its outside environment. You're putting more stress on the muscle. So how is it going to respond? Anytime you stress the cell, it's either going to respond by hypertrophy or atrophy. Muscle tends to respond by hypertrophy. Seems like an obvious kind of response for muscle. If it can't handle what it's being given, it's going to try to increase its mass in order to be able to lift the extra weight or do whatever it is being asked to do all of a sudden. Okay. So because we have more DNA present as well, it's going to be a little bit easier. Okay. And so this muscle fiber will be able to hypertrophy. Okay. That means grow its size. Okay. So you have a muscle fiber that's growing in size. How it's filling up with more myofilaments. More myofilaments means more strength. We were asking earlier about how to lift more. Well, you build more myofilaments. So it's not type 1 versus type 2 in terms of which one can lift more. It's about how big, how thick is that muscle fiber to begin with. How many myofilaments can you engage to pull against that you know, tension, to, to generate that tension, to pull against that weight? Now, uh, here's the problem. I told you at the very beginning of this course that cells are very, very efficient. If they don't need something, they will get rid of it, or they won't maintain it anymore. So when you no longer put stress on it, i.e. you start, well, you start watching more TV and playing more video games because you have reached the physique that you had hoped for, you're done, you don't need any more muscle, you're happy, you sit down in front of the TV and you say, I'm just going to take a break now for a few months. What's going to happen to those muscles? They'll go back to the size they were. So, how do you get lasting muscle increase? Well, in our case, we have to keep working out. If you were a teenager, if you were 15, 16 still, guess what? Teenagers, their muscles can also grow by hyperplasia. Which one's that? The number, yeah. Okay. In adult muscle, we're not going to increase our cell numbers. For the most part. It's unlikely. Okay. Our muscles will by hypertrophy at this point. If you were still a teenager, it would be hoped for you. You could still have hyperplasia happening and you could build up muscle that way. Now, if you start with more cells, guess what? When you start working out, that muscle mass will increase a lot faster. Okay. So, if you were active as a child, if you were active as a teenager, uh, you have probably built up a fairly big supply of those muscle fibers. And so, at this point, building up muscle mass might not be a big deal for you. All you have to do is just lift a few weights once in a while and, hey, they spring right back. Because even if each muscle fiber you know, puts on a little bit extra weight, all of them together make for a much bigger muscle. And whereas someone who has been scrawny all their childhood, maybe that's not the right term to use. <laughs> <laughs> I fall into that category too. So, I'll go with that. Um, then you might have a harder time putting on a lot of extra bulk because now you want to look like you know an action hero. Um, you might have a harder time doing that because it's got to be a bit more difficult. You don't have as many muscle fibers to work with. Yeah, you can make them all hypertrophy, but to get more noticeable difference, you're going to have to make them all hypertrophy a lot more than someone who has more muscle fibers to begin with. Question? Um, let's say if your muscle atrophies, is there a way to uh, artificially replace or add? Is there a way to artificially replace or add? Considering, because you said that the satellite cell fuses and then mm -hmm. the proteins are being produced, so I assume there's like a, uh, a 
blueprint or a frame set up what the proteins can join up into. So can we artificially, artificially introduce that? Mm. I'm not aware of it. Uh, the only artificial thing that tends to happen when people are trying to build muscle is the use of steroids. Um, and that's really there to just allow them to have more endurance so that they can keep on damaging their muscles a little bit more so that they are forced to grow a little bit faster. Okay? Uh, but beyond that, I'm not aware of anything that would allow you to have faster building muscle and some other artificial things. Yes? Can this kind of like probably use creatine and that would just... Creatine, yeah. Um, Creatine is again a, a way of adding energy. Creatine phosphate is actually the molecule, uh, and creatine phosphate has about 10 times as much energy as ATP. And in fact, a lot of your muscles actually have a store of creatine as well, and that's what they will use instead of ATP when they do run out of ATP. Okay. So that's one of those things that muscle ma magazines and muscle builders stores that sell as creatine. Um, it doesn't necessarily help that much. Okay. Again, it helps more with endurance than anything. Okay, let's move on before we run out of time and I have to do another muscle lecture next week. Um, so, I told you it was going to get more complicated. Here's the rest of the hierarchy. So, recall we had myofilaments becoming myofibrils, myofibrils within a muscle fiber. Now we have muscle fibers, which are going to be bundled together to form a muscle fascicle. Now, before they are bundled together, they are going to be surrounded by something called an endomycium which is connective tissue. It's a very fine, thin connective tissue. It's mostly going to be type 3 collagen, which is what kind of fiber? Reticular fiber, good. Okay. So mostly reticular fibers. There's going to be a lot of capillaries there. Again, the type, depending on the type of muscle fibers you have, it could be more or less. Okay. So keep that in mind as well. Um, so these muscle Fibers are bundled together to form a muscle fascicle. That fascicle is going to be surrounded by more connective tissue containing somewhat larger blood vessels. So again, the types of blood vessels that you find within the endomycium would be mostly capillaries, venules, and arterioles. Okay. Within the perimycium, which surrounds the fascicle, what you have is mostly small arteries, the small veins. And again, a thicker layer of connective tissue. A bit more type 1 collagen this time around. And then, again, these bundles of these bundles of muscle fibers or these fascicles are again bundled together to form a muscle. And that muscle, again, will be surrounded by connective tissue, which will contain blood vessels. That connective tissue then will be referred to as a epimycium. Okay, notice some of the terminology that we're seeing here. Epi endo, peri, we've seen these before in various places. Epi means upon. Okay. Epithelium comes from Greek and actually means upon nipple. Weird, I know, but that's what it means. Okay. So epi refers to upon, on top of something. So epimycium is going to be on top of the muscle. Epineurium is going to be on top of the nerve. We'll be learning about that at the end of the course. So, very similar hierarchy to muscle. We will be seeing a similar hi hierarchy with nerves as well. Okay, so, keep that in mind. And again, don't let those two confuse you. So, very similar terminology. But instead of mycium, we'll be saying neurium. Okay, so here's that hierarchy again in a drawing form. Again, myofilament, you can see in here we've got. The sarcomere, so this would be myofibril, myofibrils bundled together within a muscle fiber. Here's the nucleus of that muscle fiber. That muscle fiber is found within a fascicle. Again, these white spaces here would be the endomycium. The white stuff around the outside of this fascicle would be the perimycium. Then bundles of these together make up a muscle. And then the outside of that, the white stuff on the outside of that is the epimycium. Why do we need connective tissue? Before you ask your question, you have to ask a question too. So why do we need connective tissue around the muscle? Yes? To allow for stretching? To allow for stretching. How does connective tissue allow for stretching? Muscle fibers stretch. Well, you need to connect to any bones. 
Hmm? Connecting to the bones. Connecting to the bones, good. So we've got tendons not connected to bones. These aren't tendons. Why do we need connective tissue? So, let's do a stick figure drawing. Here's bone number one, here's bone number two. So we got bones. We want these bones to be able to be pulled towards one another. We want to be able to deeper them. So we're going to have muscle here. Let's just make it simple. This is one muscle fiber. This is one muscle cell. How is this muscle cell going to pull these bones? So it's going to be attached to the bones by a tendon. So we're going to have tendons attaching these. And these tendons are going to be continuous with that connective tissue that surrounds the muscle. Why? Okay, so the question is really, why don't we have something like this? We have our muscle fiber. Again, it's a cigar shaped sort of thing. It's a long thing. So, why don't we have something like this where we just have tendon attaching here, tendon attaching here? Yes? Is it to, if it is a muscle stand up, then it's really how much contract with this finger? So let's try to avoid any terminology for now. Let's just keep it simple in general. Okay? From this diagram, if you are a muscle fiber, which would you prefer to pull on? Just your ends, or would you want to be able to pull against everything all around you? Yeah, so you want to pull on everything around you that there's no immediate tension. Okay, so if all you had was the second option that I just drew at the bottom here, then you're only pulling here and here. You're putting a lot of force on those two ends. Okay. How likely is that to become damaged or ripped off very easily? Okay. So this right here is actually very important. So yeah, this is the endomycium, perimycium, and epimycium. This is all going to be continuous with those tendons. Okay? Uh, quite often, the general term for all of these things together, the epimycium, um, perimycium, and, and uh, endomycium, is the. Oh, right now, it's getting in line. Great. Ah. Why does this always happen? Uh, fashion. Okay, fashion. So those of you with anatomy might remember that term showing up, fascia. Basically, the connective tissue associated with muscles, surrounding muscle, the muscle fibers. So why do we need fascia? To distribute the forces. Basically, what happens is within that muscle fiber, you've got a lot of protein. When that protein contracts, Think about it this way. Let's pretend, how do you transmit those forces? Let's pretend this is our cell membrane. Okay. Within that cell membrane, we have myofilaments. What happens when these myofilaments contract? It goes from this length to this length. So instead of being this long, the muscle filament is now this long. Did that affect the cell in this drawing? No, it made no difference. If all these contract, is that going to affect the cell? No. So we need to have some way of, of 
taking this contraction that we're doing here and transmitting it to the cell and to the outside environment. Okay? And so what these cells have, besides the myosin and actin, and whatever is in the Z line and in the M line, is a bunch of proteins. Some of them are referred to as distributes. That might sound a little familiar. Dystrophy, something I've heard of before. There's different types of dystrophies, but basically they're all associated with very, uh, very much muscle weakness, easy fatigue. Basically, what tends to involve in most cases is the fact that there's a mutation in one of the genes that codes a protein that either attaches this to the membrane, which is a different kind. So you've got a protein that might attach periodically this myofibril to the cell membrane, or something that will attach the cell membrane to the outside. This is grabbing my cover for some reason. Something that's going to attach your cell to the outside environment. These cells are going to be initially surrounded by a basal lamina. Remember I mentioned that when we talked about epithelia, it's a basement membrane. Muscle fibers will have basal lamina as well. Okay. So there's a basal lamina that will then help to integrate that cell into that connective tissue that surrounds it, that endothelium. Okay. And so you've got these proteins that either attach to the cell membrane or the cell membrane to the actual outside environment. And if those proteins are mutated, then you can't transmit the forces occurring inside the cell to the endomycium, and therefore you cannot transmit that to pull on that tendon and to pull on those bones, therefore muscle weakness. Okay. okay, so this is another reason why the fascia is important. Okay. So again, we have the fascia available to bring in vasculature, but also to help transmit the forces of contraction. So some pictures now. Uh, this is cross-section of skeletal muscle at very high magnification. I'm going to outline a single cell. Here is the cell. So it's a single cell in cross-section. So you're looking at the same exact slide in different magnifications in a moment. So again, notice we have nucleus, nucleus. Got two nuclei in this cell here. A nucleus at this edge of this cell over here. Right here, there's a little bit of an open space. That's a capillary. There's another capillary over here. So this is all within the endomycium. Right? Those capillaries are there to bring in the glucose and bring in the oxygen that these cells will be using. Right? Again, not all these capillaries will be filled at all times. Why do your muscles get warm after you work out? Because there's more blood flowing to them. Right now you're sitting, you're not really using your leg muscles. Are all of them getting lots and lots of blood right now? No, they'll be inefficient. So there are going to be blood vessels that are going to cut off circulation to certain parts so that you have a minimal amount of flow going through, enough to maintain your muscles and not hurt them. But it's not enough such that they can go ahead and go to peak activity, which is why we always want to warm up before we go for a more very strenuous workout. Okay, get your muscles warmed up, warmed up, get your blood pumping. Once that happens, your muscles will work more efficiently. Okay? And then once your muscles are working, there's more blood going to be flowing to them. Then when you stop, you can feel it, they're, they're warm. That's because there's more blood flowing through them. Okay? All of these capillaries will then be supplied by blood. Again, the more blood there is, the more oxygen circulation there is within that region. And so the more oxygen is being brought to these things. Okay, so everyone see where the muscle fiber is. Look carefully. If you look, and I don't I don't, don't know how well you can see this from where you're sitting, but if you look carefully, there are little small dots, these dark, dark, I guess these pink eosinophilic dots within these cells. Yeah, let me try turning out the lights. Interesting in this room. 
Okay, so hopefully you guys can see this. There are little dots within each of these cells. They're very tightly packed together. Those are those Cotheim skills that I was talking about. Those are the myofibrils. They're packed together. You can see how tightly packed they are. There is no room in between them for anything else. That's why they're uh, pushed off to the side. And they're so tightly and densely packed that there's really no room there except for a few small mitochondria and some of that cytoplasmic reticulum there. Okay. So in very tight packing of that protein, and imagine you're going to put on a lot of muscle, you're going to start working out. The number of these will increase, so the size of the cell will increase. That cell will hypertrophy. Let's zoom out a little bit. So the fiber we were just looking at, I'll try to find it here, I don't think it's that it's possible. Uh, I don't think it's on this video this watch, I might do this one here. But basically, again, this is a single muscle fiber over here. Single muscle fiber over here. And if you're looking at your own slide, you might be able to make out the boundaries. But that endothelium, sorry, it's not endothelium, endomycium, is very, very thin. It's a very fine, very delicate sort of layer. Okay? But again, each individual muscle fiber is only generating a lot of force. It's just generating enough force to pull and again, the more of these fibers you activate, the more strength you're going to get. So, for example, what's the difference between you holding um, a pop can in your hand and you crushing a pop can? It's the same muscle being activated. The difference is more of the muscle fibers will be activated if you're crushing the pop can in your hand as opposed to just holding it. Okay. Or hold an egg gently, or crush the egg shot. What's the difference? Just the number of muscle fibers involved. So, again, individual muscle fibers. All these pink spots that you're seeing periodically are capillaries. So those are visible here as well. So lots of capillaries visible very clearly. Again, this is a cross-section through the middle muscle. Okay. At the edge here, what you're seeing is kind of a break. And there's more muscle out here. Um, this is an artifact of preparation. Basically, the tissue just separated here. Why? Because there was more connective tissue in this region. The muscle fibers were as tightly packed. Okay? So what we have in between these individual fibers would be endomycium. On the outside here, what we would have is the perimycium. Again, it's not this thick normally, but it's just basically um, a little bit more collagen, a little bit more material, and it's easier to separate them, which is what happened here. Okay? So this is why we're seeing a lot of empty space. Doesn't mean that the uh, perimycin has lots of empty space, but it just means that it's most easily damaged during the preparation of this slide. And then zoom out one more time. And again, we were just looking at this region right here. Now we can see here that this region right here would be the perimycium. Here as well, perimycium. You can see there are individual bundles, very right? tightly packed cells. Okay? These are all fascicles. All separated by a thin layer of connective tissue, that would be the perimycium. Periodically, you can see some of these blood vessels, so small to medium sized arteries and veins. And again, if we were to zoom out a little bit more, I don't have any more to zoom out from on this slide, but you can see the whole muscle itself. Okay? Again, we can see this kind of a straight edge here, that's because it was just cut, so we don't actually see the epimycin on the other side of this. But basically, you can imagine that. We zoom out a little bit more. If you have more of this stuff, the connective tissue on the outside of that would be the epimycium. Okay, let's move right along. In the last 20 minutes or so, let's cover the other two muscle types. Uh, I probably don't have quite as much to say about those. Or at least I will try not to say as much about those. But I will try to say a few important things. So, cardiac muscle is found in, obviously, the heart. Okay. That's pretty much it. It's an easy one to remember. It is involuntary, thankfully. You don't have to think about making your heart beat. Just a quick thing. It is controlled by the autonomic nervous system. Okay. So, there's going to be a nerve going in, and it's going to be there to control it to some extent. Part. Technically, it has its own pacemaker, so it doesn't really require innovation to keep on beating. The innovation is really there to change the pace. Okay? So it will be on its own just fine until it dies. 
which comes from the start of the beginning. It is very highly vascularized. Why? It needs a lot of oxygen. Why? Well, this is a muscle that isn't supposed to get tired. It has to keep beating. So that means you want to make sure it's got enough energy to do this. It means ATP, which means oxidative phosphorylation. Amazing how biochemistry keeps on, and physiology keeps on just showing up, doesn't it? They, it's all intermittent, guys. So, slow, responsible for slow, sustained, regular contraction. Mostly regular contraction. Again, it can be modified periodically. Um, the tissue has no regenerative capacity. That's mostly true. Uh, in fact, there are cardiac satellite cells. Um, they're not necessarily as successful at repairing things as you know, satellite cells and other muscle types, but they do exist. Okay? They have been found. Um, they are capable of generating new cardiac myocytes, um, but you're not going to repair a heart attack. Not yet, at least. We're working on that. Not yet. Okay? Uh, there appears to be something that blocks their ability to migrate into damaged areas, in repairing them. I'm not quite sure what that is yet. Okay. Now one would think that with the millions of years of evolution, uh, nature would have figured out a way to repair infarcts in a heart and have these satellite cells going, but it hasn't yet. I'm not quite sure why. I'm sure there's a reason nature just hasn't told us yet. So, as far as we're concerned, it has no regenerative capacity. The cells here are amitotic. If you think about this, are skeletal muscle cells mitotic? Do you think? I'll let you guys struggle with that one. Might show up as a first question. <laughs> Think about it. Are they mitotic? Why? Don't tell me now. Yeah. Think yourself. Or tell others. Have ideas. I don't mean shit. I'm not going to tell you. It's right now. Yeah. So, are they mitotic? Why? So, cardiac muscle cells are striated, not to the same extent as skeletal muscle but they are striated. They do also have myofibrils running from one end of the cell to the other. In fact, let me just maybe draw one with you guys as we're talking about these features. So, cardiac muscle fibers. Whereas skeletal muscle fibers were kind of cigar shaped like this. That's in the skeletal. And they were very, very long. They had eccentric nuclei. Cardiac are much shorter. But they are branched. other cardiac myocytes Just a few of them. They are mostly uninucleated, so the single nucleus, sometimes two. So sometimes you might have a binucleated cell. The nuclei are central. They're somewhat um, oval in shape, round to oval. And they have a bit more euchromatin than they do in skeletal muscle fibers. So a little bit larger, a little bit less condensed. 
Now, I haven't connected these cells yet. That's because there's a very important thing about that junction between the cells that I want to talk about very shortly. So there is a junction between them that connects the two cells. And it's kind of a staggered appearance. see under the electron microscope. Uh, under the light microscope, they tend to look like a somewhat irregular looking denser line. So you can actually see these structures under the light microscope as well. The structures are referred to as an intercalated disc. I'm going to spell it with K, you can spell it with C if you like. That is your choice. The only one will be part of the test models. So we have a cell that is nucleated, it has myofibrils running from one end of the cell all the way to the other. Basically, they kind of flow around that nucleus. So the striations, if you were to look for striations, they would go across the cell. So the striations would look like this. So the myofibrils run the length of the cell, the striations go across the cell. Now you notice that there is a bit of a space near the nucleus. This is the perinuclear region. Sometimes also referred to as the juxtanuclear region. That's why we tend to find a lot of the organelles, like, for example, Golgi apparatus, ER, that sort of thing. Uh, but again, you're going to have an extensive network of sarcoplasmic reticulum within this cell, stretched all along the length of the cell. And one of the reasons that we don't really see the striations as clearly in cardiac muscle cells, as we do in striated muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells, is that in between the myofibrils, we have long stretches of mitochondria. They're kind of in these long rows. And so they kind of separate the myofibrils from one another so that they're not as tightly packed. And therefore, the striation pattern is not as easily visible on the slides. So the point here is that cardiac myocytes have a lot more mitochondria than you find in skeletal muscle. Why? Well, you want to live, don't okay? you? It's basically the simplest question. You want to make sure that you have lots and lots of mitochondria so you can generate lots and lots of ATP so that your cells can continue working regardless of what is going on, regardless of whether you're running regardless of whether you're sleeping, regardless of whether you have a really good blood supply or if you've been a couch potato all your life and you've got atherosclerosis, you want to make sure that that heart keeps on pumping regardless and it cannot, can continue to pump 
regardless of how good your oxygen supply is. So, yeah. So the perinuclear region contains organelles. So things like Golgi apparatus, no mitochondria, ER, all kinds of things. Anything that this cell requires it doesn't have to squish off to the sides, it can be right near the nucleus because there's a bit of room because those myofibrils have to separate to allow the nucleus to be in place. Now, when these cells contract, what's going to happen? We don't have an endomycium. We don't have an endomycium. We don't have a perimycium. Well, not like what we saw with the spindle muscle. Yeah? They pull out They pull out their surrounding cells. They pull out their neighbors. Okay. So, that means that this region right here, that stepwise sort of thing, has to be specialized to allow this to happen. Okay? So first of all, if we can zoom in on that, so let's kind of zoom in on this integrated disk. Just draw these stepwise sort of structures. Again, our cells are going like this. And we have myofibrils coming in here. From both sides. So if you were a cell, what would you want to have? There's going to be a region here. Either side of this integrated disc. Which is referred to as the it's gonna be confusing a little bit. Fascia adherence. Seems scientists like that term fascia. Sorry. Okay. This is the fascia adherence. Basically, it's a mass of proteins right at the end of that cell that kind of act like a Z line for all of these sarcomenes that are coming in. So they're what the myofibrils are attaching themselves to. Okay, so the myofibrils, you can think of them as being embedded within the fascia adherence. So when that myofibril pulls, when it contracts, it's pulling against the fascia adherence on its end. Okay, so how do you transmit this to a neighboring cell? What kind of junctional complex do you think you want to have in place? You've seen that before, yeah? Sorry? A hearing junction. What kind of a hearing junction more specifically? Sorry? A gap junction will be for something else. We'll be seeing those soon too. Desmosomes, thank you. Okay. Remember, that's, they're like the rivets on your genes, desmosomes. So you're going to have desmosomes. Okay. The desmosomes will be able to transmit that force that's being generated within one cell to the neighboring cell. And so what you have is if both of those cells are contracting, they're kind of pulling against one another and trying to separate away from one another, but the desmosome is keeping them from doing that. And so they end up being pulled closer together. And so that's why you have your heart doing this. When it's beating, it's getting a little smaller and then relax. Smaller, relax. Okay? So all you have, what you have is all these muscle fibers kind of pulling these one, they're all shortening it, so the whole muscle becomes smaller. And again, because they are connected as a network, you don't just have a single chain of cells doing this, you have all of them pulling against each other. Another reason to have them all branched like this is that. Again, recall, uh, cardiac muscle fibers don't actually um, require innervation. Okay? They will beat on their own. Okay? How do they do that? If you have some you know, vagus nerve out there somewhere, 
changing something. That's going to be converted to a change in all the rest of the cells in some way, but not by that one nerve. So that's just staying close to where the point of entry was. Okay, so that's, that's going to be transmitted in some other way. And that's going to be transmitted by gap junctions. So in this region here, longitudinal region, so in the transverse region, we have fascia adherence in the desmosome. So transverse, that would be this region right here, the transverse region. transverse region, you have things that are specialized to resist stress. Okay. In this longitudinal region over here, you have gap junction. Again, it makes sense because in longitudinal regions, you don't have as much stress being placed on that part of the cell, on that part of the membrane. And so these gap junctions are perfectly safe here. They're not going to get damaged when these cells pull against one another. And these gap junctions are going to allow for transmitting of impulses, transmitting of that, um, that depolarization that basically tells these cells, all together, let's contract, let's contract, let's contract. So there's going to be a signal going through and it's going to be spread by all these cells to all of their neighbors within this network. Okay? So again, the more cells that this cell is connected to, the more cells will know what this cell is doing and the more of them will be able to join it. So the gap junctions will allow for coordination of that contraction to occur and to spread throughout that whole cardiac muscle. Yeah? Um, is that legal to transverse Yes. So this is the length of the muscle fiber itself. So this would I think be one muscle cell. Okay, back to our our slides. Okay, pictures. Pictures. Okay. Again, cardiac muscle is highly vascularized. So when you're looking at slides, you are likely to see a lot of blood cells and blood vessels. So you've got a couple of red blood cells showing up here. There's obviously papillary here. There's another one over here as well. Uh, there's another one down here, a little bit of focus. There's another one up here, a little bit of focus as well. There is a nucleus of a myocyte. You can see that juxtanuclear region right here and here. These fibers you're seeing here, these thick bundles that you're seeing here, are myofibrils going up and down within the cell. This dark line you're seeing here, there's another one over here, you can kind of see the stepwise sort of appearance of it, here's another one over here. These are the integrated discs. So basically this end is one edge of the cell, this is the other edge of the cell. Okay. So you have integrated discs, through the nucleus, just the nuclear region, and you can see muscle uh, myofibrils running the length of the cell, and if you look very carefully, you might notice that the striation pattern goes across like this. Okay. Might be a little bit more easily visible in this region here. So striation pattern going across this slime. Okay. That's your I bands and your A bands, your dark bands and light bands showing up. Okay. Again, they're not as clearly visible in cardiac muscle because they're not as tightly packed. The myofibrils are separated, and all these empty spaces that you're seeing here, they're not really empty. What you have are very large mitochondria. Okay. Mitochondria and cardiac muscle fibers are actually specialized. They're much larger than they would be in a typical cell. They're still not quite big enough to see under the light microscope, but they are large enough for, them, for their existence to be clearly visible, just by the fact that the myofibers are so separated from one another. Here's another example you can see here. I'd like to notice if you don't look too closely at it, just kind of look at the whole thing, and look at the pattern of the cells that are showing you here. If you look, you'll notice that there's branching going on. Right? So you may not see the striation pattern. You may not see if the nucleus is central or not. But notice that it's got blood vessels. This is an artifact of preparation. It's got some blood spilled here. 
Uh, but if you look carefully, notice there's branching going on. Um, there's branching going on here. So these are not continuous cells in long chains. Um, they are, in fact, branching. Okay? And periodically, you do see these darker lines sometimes. We can actually see evidence of those interplated disks. Yeah? Do you ever observe the mitochondria? You have to have a very, very good microscope. Usually, the electron microscope is what you have to have. Mitochondria are about the size of a bacteria. So, they're very tiny. They're close to the limit of resolution of the light microscopes. So, usually, you don't see mitochondria. Also, remember, it's a membranous organelle, so it's very difficult to really stain membranes. So, you have to have something else that will pick it up. And again, I mentioned to you guys last time when we talked about osteoblasts. Osteoblasts are used in the they have, because they have lots of mitochondria. So you can see a little bit of the eosinophilia. But again, if the rest of the cell is eosinophilic, like because we have lots of protein and myoglobin here, it's not going to show up as a difference. Right? So it's going to be very difficult to really visualize the mitochondria unless you have some sort of antibody that can actually pick it up. Okay? So uh, before you guys run off, let's just cover the Purkinje fibers and I'll let you go and I'll have the TAs cover the smooth muscle uh, in the labs with you guys. So again, the uh, quiz this week will be based on. Uh, what I covered in lectures, so by all means read through the smooth muscle part, but you know, the TAs will cover that part in the lecture, in their pre labs, so you don't have to know it specifically for the quiz this time around. So, Purkinje fiber is basically a specialized um, muscle fiber. Okay? So, it has some of the same characteristics as a typical cardiac muscle fiber, but it's a lot larger. Okay? And the Purkinje fiber is actually specialized to carry impulses and allow them to spread much more quickly. Okay. So maybe what I can do is show you this first. You take a physiology so you hopefully know where the AV node is, etc. But basically what we have is the impulse is spreading from this point on and it goes down the septum here and spreads into two separate bundles of this. Should I turn this to use? Again, we have two different ventricles, so they're going to have different impulses going through them, and they will be pumping different things. Uh, so you have two bundles going down the septum here and spreading out. And basically, these are made of Purkinje fibers. So you can see that they spread out uh, to various regions of the cardiac muscle, from which point they will transmit their impulses to neighboring cardiac myocytes, which will then transmit that to all of their neighbors. And so this allows for much faster conduction of an impulse from here down to the part that actually does most of the work. Okay. So what does the Purkinje fiber look like? Um, again, it's a, just a much larger cardiac myocyte. So same, same sort of idea. Um, pretty large, somewhat branched, not as much as a typical cardiac myocyte. It is going to have some myofibrils, but those are mostly around the periphery of the cell. The central region of the cell is going to have a nucleus, sometimes more than one. Um, in fact, quite frequently we do see a binucleus. Okay. Um, and around the nucleus, it usually stores a lot of glycogen. Okay. Now, again, during slide preparation, that glycogen is removed, and so what we end up seeing is this empty space surrounding the nucleus. Again, usually if you're looking for them, look around the endocardium, close to the inside of the heart. Okay. Um, and if you're looking for them, you're looking for something like this. Where you can see here, this will be the boundary of the cell. Here's the nucleus and the clear space around it. The fuzzy edges that you're seeing around the outside of all these cells are the myofibrils. So basically we have the nucleus, a clear space around it where the glycogen used to be. And then around the periphery of the cell you have these myofibrils um, just basically marking the outside of the actual cell itself. Yeah? Well, uh, will they have different lateral specialization, say, more than junction? Because they need to spread the impulse. So they need to, yeah, they need to spread the impulse. Uh, whether they have more lateral specialization, I'm not really sure that they necessarily spread them sideways. Um, they kind of tend to be used to, as a kind of a highway, just to really quickly get an impulse to the area that needs to get that bit quickly. And then the okay, myocytes will take care of the rest. Uh, in terms of whether they actually do have some gap junctions along the sides, just to get in touch with these cells out here, I don't really know. I haven't really seen much to, to speak to that. There's usually very little information that is to Here's another, just a high magnification image. And again, notice we've got per uh, periodically two nuclei showing up within these cells. Okay. 
Okay, so I'll leave it off here and I'll get the case copy, but it's not so I will pick it up next week with I think blood vessels. By the way, for the exams, for the upcoming exams, the practical exams, and the midterms, you're only responsible for the stuff covered this week. That will include smooth muscles, so pay attention in like in labs. So that's fair game for you. Uh, but basically everything that we cover from next week's off.